Launching a business can take you on a journey unlike any other, filled with anticipation, uncertainty, and the constant search for answers. You're never quite sure what's coming next, which is why it helps to have a partner that does. Plan for the future of your business with the bank trusted by 50% of US-based, venture-backed tech and life science companies. Silicon Valley Bank, built for what's next. Welcome everyone to our Future of Work keynote. I couldn't have asked for a better counterpart here than our very own Jennifer Christie, CHRO of, of Twitter. Uh, I'm Kevin Diestel. I'm one of the partners with Sapphire Ventures and couldn't be more excited to, uh, to have you join us today. I'm really excited to be here, Kevin. Awesome. Well, I thought we would jump right into it right off the bat and talk a little bit about Twitter's decision to be the first to have a work from home forever policy. So maybe you could walk us through that decision-making process and how you weighed the pros and cons. Sure. Well, what really prepared us to be able to do that very early in the stages of the, of the pandemic was actually work that we started in the early part of 2018. Obviously, we didn't foresee a global pandemic in the future, but what we did see was that a lot about work was changing. And in fact, we were offering work from home forever for about two years now. Um, and so let me, get, let me take you back into yeah, kind of how that, that decision started, because that's really what preceded all of this. So in 2018, we launched a new workforce strategy called Global Blueprint. And what that was about is that we looked to the future and said, wow, the way people are working is really starting to change. We're seeing companies come online right now that have no offices, you know, we're, we are hearing our own employees ask for more flexibility. And we're also recognizing that you don't have to come to Silicon Valley or San Francisco to find great talent anymore, especially in the tech space. That used to be kind of where everyone would converge and find talent. But so many other industries and so many other locations now have great talent. And so we, we looked at ourselves and said, if we are going to really be innovative in the future, if we're going to be able to attract and, and retain the right people to, to drive us forward, we're going to start to really need to start to change. Because back at that time, we were very headquarter centric, like a lot of tech companies in that area, very office centric. And how did we, how are we going to evolve to be more inclusive of remote workers, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So we launched this strategy and a flexible work program that really allowed us to offer part-time and full-time remote work. It allowed us to start recruiting people who are full-time remote. And it allowed us to for people to move offices so they could raise their hand and say, you know, I really want to keep my job, but I'd rather live here. I'd rather live there. Can I do that? And and we allowed And this had all predated this had predated COVID. This this was in 2018. And so how so, far along into into that like the adoption of that policy did you guys get before a, a global pandemic? Yeah, so I would say we were about halfway there. Um, so if we thought the future was a lot farther out. You know, we weren't preparing for the big launch in 2020. We still thought this was going to be a longer transformation. Mm -hmm. But we had really increased the number of remote workers in our, com our company. We'd started hiring in different locations. Um, we'd started decentralizing and distributing teams across the globe, moving more leadership positions and all of that. So we weren't, we weren't exactly where we were supposed to be down the road. But I would say it accelerated us down a path that we were already on. So when the pandemic hit, we took a step back and said, we can do this. We're, we're ready. We don't have it all squared away, but um, we're, we can take that step forward now. Got it. And so it sounds like a lot of this transition had been made, obviously, prior to, to COVID. How has COVID changed things for a, a 5,000 employee company that spans the globe? And, and and what does the the world and what does the world of work look like coming out of this? 
Yeah, so a few things. Um, obviously, uh, when, when we're thinking about giving people flexibility and optionality, which was really the core of our program, that's a little different than saying everybody has to work remotely. And so we've been keeping our hand on the pulse of our employees during this period of time through surveys and other ways that we listen to them. And we're seeing definitely a shift in, in people's preferences about how they want to work coming out of COVID. And uh, I would say right now, the, the, the lion's share of the people who are at Twitter want to actually split their time. So we're seeing people saying, you know, when we come back on the other side of this, I probably want to work from home three or more days a week, but I still want to have some interaction in the office. Um, so it's, it's, it's providing that optionality, which right now, everyone has the same option, which is working from home. So we're, we're starting to really think about how do we come out of this and do it in a way where we keep this level playing field that everyone has now when people are splitting their time between the office and at home and we don't end up back in the situation where you have the haves and the have nots. You get, get a little better experience in the office than you do at home. So that's what we're really focused on right now. One thing you had mentioned to me when we had chatted earlier was was a great phrase. The, the future of work is... I don't want to steal the slogan, but is the, <laughs> is the now is the now of work. Um, right. Do you think you could unpack that for us? Because I, I just thought it really hit home uh, in this yeah. day and age. No, of course. Yeah, you know, we've been talking a lot about the future of work. You know, conferences for the last few years have been obsessing about the future of work, and I, I think we're kind of at the point where it is the now of work. The future is here. We are in a very transformational period of time, and even before COVID people had started talking about this being the fourth industrial revolution, you know, with uh, smart tech and AI and robotics and nanotechnology, et cetera. People were already saying that this was going to fundamentally transform, you know, transform industries and in how we work. I would say that COVID, however, a global pandemic and a global economic crisis on top of that has, has moved us into maybe the fifth industrial revolution or has transformed the fourth one at least, because I do think there's some fundamental shifts that are going to go on with this. We talked about preferences in Twitter, but I think there's companies now that are offering remote work that had never even contemplated it, that would never think, oh, our people can't do that from home. They have to be in the office. Well, they're doing it from home and employees are starting to adapt and they're starting to get good at working from home. And a lot of them are going to want that option when they come, when we're on the other side of this. So the, there's a, the concept that offering flexibility is a perk or a nice to have, I think is, is gone. I think it's table stakes and it, employees are going to feel like it's their right. Mm -hmm. And for companies that feel like this was going to be over at some point, we don't need to prepare for that. are probably going to miss out on talent if they continue to think that that remote work is something that not really for them because employees are going to, I think, demand it. And have you seen other HR and employee leaders taking a similar stance as, as you and Twitter have? I have, you know, like I said, I, I, I network actually with CHROs across industries and we are always kind of sharing ideas and what's happening. And, and in earlier days with, with other industries outside of tech, when I was talking about remote working and distributing our workforce and getting away from this headquarters mentality and, and really decentralizing, um, it sounded a little far-fetched and they're like, yeah, well, that's not really us. We, we want all our people together. It's way we drive our culture and a lot of them are reaching out to me now saying like, okay, we're going to have to figure this out. We can't just demand that everyone live in a certain place. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a different world now. People are leaving cities. Um, they, wanna, they want to live, you know, find bigger places to live, live in different, different ways and, and have communities around them where they, where they choose versus mm -hmm. having to move for work. I just think that's, uh, that's kind of those days are in the past. One thing I did, I did want to touch on um, was just what are some of the consequences, like some of the cons of, of a work environment like this? A remote work environment? Yeah. I would say some of the cons are a couple of things that, that even we are focused on is around how do you continue to drive culture when your culture was really very much office driven? And that was something that we have really obsessed about. And our, our culture, what we really realized, our culture wasn't so office driven, it was people driven and social driven. Um, and that was the office made that okay and easy. So we've really had to look for other ways to, to create that. Um, Slack has been a great option for us uh, to be able to engage in kind of fun and, and 
different ways instead of just always, you know, from a work perspective. So sharing different things and having different Slack channels where people can engage in the kind of office banter that they would yeah. in an office. Um, informal information sharing is also something that we've been thinking about and how we do that actually asynchronously because that's been a challenge. Um, if you think that you're going to operate the same way that you operate in an office, just in a remote setting, you're probably going to, a lot of things are probably going to fall through the cracks. And a lot of that, if, if your information sharing is very much based on being in person and real time communication, um, there's probably a lot of things that are going to get missed. So, you know, getting better at documentation, getting better at asynchronous working and just finding other ways to have those inform informal information sharing um, opportunities that you don't get when everyone's in an office together. Yeah, you mentioned on on culture, which is a big area of our conversation previously, and mm -hmm. maybe touch upon how does culture get set within an organization, but more specifically within within Twitter? Is that from the top? Is it from the bottom? Where, where does that get established? You know, and interestingly enough, we, at Twitter, our culture in, it very much mirrors our service. So this concept of um, open access and transparency. Um, is is definitely something that is core to our culture, and then all voices and and a mix of different voices is also something that is very core to us. Of so people being able to speak their truth and and share their life, and I will tell you, you know, remote working has just brought that even closer to home for us because uh, you know at Twitter people are on our service, our, our employees who we call tweeps are on our service, so we see their lives outside of the office already. And so they're sharing things about their life. We're, we're hearing what they're passionate about. We're watching them have conversations. And so we've always had kind of a, not as much distinction between at work or at, at home. Now with now we're seeing people's lives play out uh, during meetings and all of that. So it's just bringing it even closer. So in some ways this is helping our culture and bringing us even closer together and in different ways. Um, but I, I still think that, you know, our core principles of, of open access and all voices and transparency is something that we've maintained while we've um, been in this environment. And, mm -hmm. and even our one team meetings, which we do every month, which we thought were such culture drivers, they would be broadcast out of San Francisco to all of our offices around the world. Um, and now we're doing them all virtually and everybody has the same shared experience. You don't have that haves and the have nots, the people in the room in San Francisco versus the people who are watching it. You know, everyone has the same access to ask questions, has the same access to see what's going on and engage in the same way. So um, I know people have, are, are really concerned about culture, but I do think there's real opportunities here to drive, drive culture in different ways. Yeah, HR, even culture to a certain extent, sometimes takes a, a, a backseat to things from, from Mindshare. How, how do you find that partnership with as an example, our audience right now is, is a lot of executive level C-suite people, CIOs, CEOs, um, CHROs. Like, any advice on on how you find that right partner or how you work and collaborate together in order to set that culture? Yeah. So, I, I there's a couple things, I guess. One is is particularly like the the CIO and the CHRO or HR and IT. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, the partnership now is more critical than ever. In the past, and you and I talked about this previously, in the past, you know, IT and HR would come together when there was a, a system to implement or some type of integration to kind of work on. But the work was, I, I've, it, in my experience anyway, had, had been more siloed. Now, the partnership with our IT team is so integrated. We are jointly planning together on things outside of HR systems, but it's really more around integrated enterprise communication tools, collaboration tools, and even our workplace strategies, how mm -hmm. they're set up, not just in the office, but remote working uh, setups as well. So just everything we do now is needs to be powered by technology. And it's it's really a great opportunity because there's so many, there's so much innovation in the space right now. And HR has not always been known for the space of uh, yeah. tech innovation. Um, but there's a lot going on right now because everyone's trying to figure out how to create the water cooler remotely, how to make sure people can collaborate and share ideas asynchronously and synchronously in this environment. So everyone's trying to solve these problems. And I think it's a real opportunity for us to come together and and influence the, the next wave of this innovation that's coming our way. No, that's great. Um, shifting gears 
a little slightly, I, I did want to touch on the topic of, of diversity and inclusion. Um, the world has been more recently embroiled with social injustice, but prejudice can come in age, race, gender, um, et cetera. How does Twitter view the, the topic of diversity and inclusion and, and what are you doing about it? Yeah, so it's interesting. Our journey for around diversity and inclusion has really paralleled our broader workforce strategy because it's been a real part of it. And so just like COVID has, has accelerated us from a remote working uh, perspective, the events of this past summer, you know, where the conversations around social justice and equity have really come to the forefront of both internal and external conversations, um, it, it really brought to the fore work that we've been doing over the past few years. And so uh, it helped us be on our front foot, I think, during this period of time, because uh, we did, our, our employees know that we've been committed to this and on this journey. And so it didn't feel reactive. It felt very much a part of what we'd already committed to. And some of what that looks like is we have embedded diversity and inclusion across all of our systems and, and across all of our processes So in, in our program. So it's not the work of an IND team, if you will, to run these programs and to champion these things. We hold everybody accountable mm-hmm. to that. It's actually part of our DNA. And we set really aggressive goals and we report out on those on a regular basis. So we have a quarterly blog that we, we report out on what our representation numbers are, how are we tracking against hiring and retention. Uh, we have a uh, monthly check-in with all of our leaders of all of our organizations to look at their specific programs. And, and a couple of years ago, we also launched what we call a diversity dashboard because we were reporting out on our diversity and inclusion numbers um, at the company level, which, you know, people looked at those and said, oh, that's great. But what does that mean for the team I'm on? Or what does that mean for this tech team versus a sales team? And so we said, you know, we'll, we'll provide that information. We'll be more transparent. So all of our employees now have access to a dashboard that they can click on and look at any particular team's diversity numbers um, that are self-reported by our employees. But we just we're trying to provide that accountability and uh, transparency in what we're trying to achieve. But like I said, we've been on this on this journey for a few years now. And um, when all of this happened this year, we came together and just talked about, is there anything we need to reprioritize? Are there any gaps that we need to, to focus on and, um, you know, keep moving forward? No, oh, awesome. Uh, one other thing you had mentioned that I loved was, um, I believe it was people first as like the true, true north for, for the company and, and for you. Um, how else have you been making sure that that, that direction is solidly that, that North Star element for you guys uh, at Twitter? Yeah, so I mean, it certainly was underpinned our decisions around COVID. Uh, you know, it was it's it was it made everything very clear when when you're putting your people first, and that is your north star for how you make decisions. Um, decisions like do we send everybody home was an it was an easy yes. Yeah. Um, it's it's it was for their safety and for the safety of the communities they live in. So that was that was a clear choice. But it comes down to a lot of other things. Like for example, this year performance ratings, we suspended those for for. The, for 2020. And we did that because we knew everybody was working really hard. They were trying their best and everyone was dealing with myriad circumstances, that, you know, all different kind of things. And we knew that it would have been unfair and hard at the end of a year to look back and, and evaluate people against goals that are constantly changing too. this world that we're in is, is constantly evolving. And because Twitter service is so, um, is so, I guess, impacted by what's going on in the mm-hmm. world, we're always having to recalibrate and figure out, okay, what's next? How do we how do we reprioritize? How do we shift resources here or there? I mean, a lot of people have been coming on our service looking for information about COVID. And so that's created an, you know, a, a focus on making sure that we're doing the best we can about that information and providing the best customer service we can um, around that. So I would just say like every decision we say, like, what's the best, what's in the best interest of our people? And because they they trust us with that. And it just underpins every decision we make. No, that's, I, I think a lot of people will try to emulate that um, after hearing this. I did want to let you uh, share your wealth of knowledge with the rest of the, the, the audience on maybe just sharing some advice uh, for other CIOs and CEOs who would be looking to, whether it's help garner 
um, a work from home environment, remote work, um, even some of the cultural aspects of, of building a, a business as large as Twitter. Any words of wisdom you want to depart <laughs> and leave with them? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll share what I can just in terms of what I've learned. I, I continue to learn every day. But um, I would say that, uh, you know, when you're when you're trying to promote change that people don't quite understand and see yet, um, I, I think anyone in a, a role, a CIO, CFO, uh, any any C role, if you yeah. will, um, C-suite role, there's an obligation to look to the future and there's an obligation to try to see around corners. Um, that's we need to prepare our, our organizations for what's next because so many people in our company are prepared, focused on what's right now. And in our role, trying to lift our head up and look, look around and see what, what the future holds, I think is in, it's incumbent upon us. And it, sometimes it is difficult when uh, people don't see that future or see that vision in the same way and aren't ready for the change. Uh, and so driving that change and bringing people along can be a challenge. And it's definitely a learning for me was when it was a very clear why and we made that case for why everyone adapted and moved very quickly to adjust. The why was keeping you safe. The why was making sure that everyone was healthy and everyone bought into that. And I think if when we focus on change and, and preparing our organizations, really be being clear about the why. Mm -hmm. um, using data as much as you can to underpin that using the experience that people have as much as, as anything as well. Because I do think more and more in terms of the shift, uh, you know, employers are becoming, employees are becoming more and more empowered and they're demanding more. And it's not just the kind of basic things that we always have, you know, kind of had that obligation back to them, you know, fair pay, all of those things. They're demanding a great experience at work. They're demanding flexibility and choice and they have options. And so um, our ability to create environments for them um, and and really see what they need and make that possible for them should be uh, how people make decisions or a, a certain, I mean, definitely a strong factor in how people make decisions about what they're doing for their organization. Yeah, well, you, you mentioned people look to Twitter to get information, certainly share information. I think they also look for you to set an example for, for businesses um, globally, and you've done a great job at, at doing that. So I uh, really appreciate you um, sharing some of your, your wisdom and experience uh, with, with the audience and with myself. Really appreciate you taking some time with us um, and looking forward to just seeing what else uh, you guys can, can jam out at, at Twitter and uh, would love to, to continue to stay close to you guys. Listen, I, I appreciate the opportunity and we certainly don't have it all right. Um, I think we're all learning on this together, but um, anything that is useful to share, um, hopefully people who had something to take away from it. So I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, that's the end of our keynote there on future of work. Uh, thanks again to Jennifer Christie, CHR of Twitter. And with that, I will let you guys get back to the conference. Thanks so much.